Good morning, everyone. This is the start of a colloquial session on August 12th. It is almost 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be beginning this session in about 15 minutes, and I just wanted to check in. It will be Professor Leon Roberts, and uh, Professor Roberts is Consumers, Online Privacy Concerns, that's his topic, two decades of research, and today's session, he's focusing in on the U.S. Uh, there'll be a second session we haven't scheduled yet where he'll be looking at the European Union and the privacy laws there, which, um, as most of us know, uh, are different than what we have here. So I'm going to pause the recording and come back to it uh, when we're ready to go. The recording. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our UBIS Colloquia. And the colloquia is going to be on consumer privacy, online privacy concerns. Uh, our speaker is Leon Roberts, and we're going to start letting uh, some interested uh, students and faculty members and staff in to uh, enjoy this presentation. So here we go. All righty. Okay, it looks like uh, waiting for one more person to come in, and we'll probably get a few people uh, coming in um, at the last minute, but that's fine. Good evening. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure whether it's a good day, it's good evening, or it's good morning. <laughs> it's How it's all. On the it's all of the above. <laughs> hi, 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 guys. All right. Hi, well, good, Very good, good to see you. Good to see oh, you. My pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, let me formally start. I want to welcome everyone to the, um, this is the UBIS Colloquia for August. Um, this is the first of two presentations we have this month. And what I wanted to mention uh, before we start is that we have a new format now. We're taking uh, feedback that we got from uh, all of you that uh, you love these sessions, but you also would like them to be more concise in timing. And we agreed with that feedback. So we're gonna run it with a five minute introduction. The speaker's gonna have 20 minutes to present, and then we'll do a five minute wrap up where we'll take some questions. With regard to questions, we ask that you put your questions in the chat and I will moderate those questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will do one other thing, too, is we will be sending you an email after the presentation with the goal of getting your feedback on two essential items. One is, did you find the presentation valuable? Did you find the topic interesting? Um, which we hope you say yes to. And the second one is timing. We do not have a belief that one set time works for everyone. As you all know, you're in multiple time zones in multiple countries around the world. So what we're going to do is after each of these uh, colloquia, we're gonna send you in that email a request just to comment on the timing. Did this Saturday time work for you? Would the next one we're doing on August 30th is going to be um, at 1 p.m. Eastern time on a Wednesday. Uh, we wanted to see if during the week for some people that might work just as well as a weekend session. And we're gonna to try to take all of that into consideration when we do scheduling. Um, so these are for you. And so we really value whatever feedback you have uh, in letting us know the value, the timing, and anything else you want us to know. But we have two, those two basic questions we're gonna ask you as we go along. So it is my pleasure right now to formally introduce Leon Roberts, who's our speaker. This is actually the first of two presentations that Leon's going to make. We haven't scheduled the second one yet, uh, and it's not conditional on how well you do on this one, Leon. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but, we've, but we talked about having consumer online privacy is such an important issue, but yet Leon's expertise also extends to Europe. And as most of us know, the laws in Europe are more strict than the laws in the US. And so to really cover this topic fully, we talked uh, at length about needing to schedule two sessions. And so I'm really pleased that this is the first of two. And obviously we will keep you informed when uh, Leon's ready to, and we're, we're ready to, to schedule the second presentation. 
with that introduction, I'm going to let Leon talk about himself and his topic and then go right into the presentation. Leon, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Goldsmith. Good morning, good afternoon, maybe it's good evening some places and good night to everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so as you see, my name is uh, Leon Roberts. I have been involved in marketing for more than 30 years. Uh, so I come from the traditional marketing, mostly business to business background. And I've studied e-commerce uh, business models and I'm completing my dissertation on a, a doctoral, uh, a doctor of business administration uh, program focusing on consumer privacy concern because uh, my current profession is heavily involved in digital marketing. I'm also a professor here at UBIS and a couple of other uh, institutions. So uh, before, without anything else, I'm just going to jump right into uh, what's supposed to be my 20 minute uh, presentation. Dr. Goldsmith, I uh, indicated that uh, this is going to be two parts. So uh, you can consider this to be uh, an overview of the much uh, more comprehensive presentation. Uh, privacy and uh, personalization on the internet go hand in hand. Uh, if you consider something like uh, salt, sugar, and fat, those are the ingredients for uh, what we consider to be a lot of bad food. Uh, so many people think those are bad for you. On the internet, most people think the data that companies are collecting are bad for the consumers. But just like salt, sugar, and fat taste great to the consumer, a personalized ad is highly beneficial to the consumer as well. In the meantime, they hate the fact that we are collecting the data. So uh, that's what this presentation is mostly about. It will address, address a lot of the issues that consumers are having. Uh, so let me quickly uh, switch to sharing my screen here. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Goldsmith, uh, can you see my screen properly? Yes, it's very nice. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, like I said, the, the focus of this presentation really uh, revolves around uh, personalization on the internet, using consumers' uh, data that we consider uh, to be our personal property, just like anything else we own. Uh, most consumers are beginning to think that the data belongs to them. So uh, uh, throughout this presentation and in the future ones, we will address these main points, uh, personalization, what it is in a brief way, uh, the benefits of personalization to the consumer and to the marketer. And then I'll touch on uh, the, some of the privacy concerns, a few of the theories that we've used to try to understand what exactly is going on with a consumer who uh, clicks on an ad, uh, follows through, buys a product, and then sues the company for collecting the data. And uh, we look at some of the responses uh, from both the consumer and the marketer and some potential solutions. So uh, this is the framework we're gonna be using to uh, discuss these topics. Uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to uh, post your questions and we'll uh, try to take them at the end. But before I continue, I have a short activity for you. As I did tell you, I teach at UBIS and we believe in uh, engagement. So uh, please go to this website for me. And you could click any link after you go there. I will get back to that in a second. So it's france.fr forward slash en. Uh, I prefer that because I, people are all over the world. Hopefully it takes you to the English version or maybe you could stick with whatever version shows up on your page. I will get back to asking you uh, what happened to you <laughs> when you went to this website, what did you do when you encountered what you encountered? So uh, personalization, what exactly is it? Uh, personalization in marketing really goes back a long way. 
Uh, we've always tried to personalize products, customize products. Um, we've personalized advertising offline only to the extent that we would look at what people are interested in, for example, in a newspaper or a TV program, and then show ads that relate to those programs. But those ads don't necessarily relate to the person's uh, needs. So personalization on the internet involves so showing people the right content in the right format, like as a text, as an image, as a video, uh, and to the right person at the right time and in the right context. In other words, personalization on the internet is about showing people uh, ads that are relevant to their lifestyle, to their behavior, and to the things that they are interested in, in the moment, which is in real time, compared to if you were reading a newspaper or a magazine the, the, that was printed some either weeks, a month, or some days ago. And you're probably no longer interested in what you were interested in at the point of printing it. So, like I said, the history of personalization goes way back in marketing. And uh, um, traditionally, marketers focus on what we call segmentation, uh, finding a group of consumers that have similar wants and needs, and then advertising the same thing to those people. One-to-one -one marketing is an extreme version of that, where we want to advertise to individuals, not groups. Uh, on the internet, personalization relates to collecting data about people's browsing habits, their location, their demographics, their psychographics, and everything else, and then showing ads to those people in real time. And that is termed uh, online behavioral advertising. So uh, we have a specific classification or name that we give to online personalization, and that's OBA uh, for short. For consumers, the basis of us getting free content on the internet, every single thing we read online, everything we watch online, we get it because someone paid for it and it's not us. So uh, from an economic standpoint, there is no free lunch. Someone pays and it usually is the advertiser who is making the payment for us to get free content. So we're making an ex exchange online, basically. If you go to my website, and you read something for free, I paid for it, or someone paid me to show it to you. You go to the New York Times, to CNN, to Fox, and you read or watch anything, you're going to see advertisements because someone paid for us to get free content. If you don't want to see advertising, I think you know what to do, right? <laughs> you go behind the paywall and you pay. But nowadays, they're like, you're paying, but it's not enough, so we want more. And as a result, Netflix and Disney is deciding to show us ads for something we subscribe for. That's because they're subsidizing the content we paid for and screamed and said the price was too high. So the basis of free content is actually advertising on the internet. Consumers find the personalized ads useful. It's relevant. It saves us a lot of time. We don't have to search so much because the thing we thought about, somehow the advertiser knows and decides to show it to us and we don't have to go searching the whole internet for this content. For the marketer, it's profitable because personalized ads gets what we call click throughs. It means people see an ad and it's relevant, it's useful, I'm interested in it, I click on it. If the ad is not related to something I'm interested in, I am not going to click it. Now, I don't want to get too far off here because this is a very complex uh, city, uh, system. So if you see an ad that you're not interested in, the fact that a consumer didn't click the ad does not mean the advertiser doesn't pay to show the ad because we're paying for what's called an impression, a view. So if we show ads to people and they're not interested, we're still paying. And the person never clicked to visit our website to see the thing we were advertising. It's a waste of a lot of money. So personalized ads, like I said, results in higher click-through rates, visits to the website, higher purchase intention. Why? Because I'm already interested in the thing that I'm uh, seeing. And it increases or improves the positive attitude towards the ads. And uh, in the end, for an advertiser, this generates a strong competitive advantage for an advertiser that is showing 
consumers personalize ads. On my screen, what you're seeing is a lot of the different types of ads that you may see online. So they're vertical, they're horizontal. These are all image ads. Some are video ads. Uh, so if you go to any website, MSN, um, Yahoo, um, any website that's information-based, there are a lot of these ads there. And someone is paying for these ads. If you visit like a car dealership, uh, the next thing you know, you get hammered with a lot of ads for cars. You visit Home Depot or Lowe's, the same thing happens. You visit Macy's, then they're showing you shoes. And in that case, if you go to a specific aisle in some of these stores, you're going to get ads that are based on that aisle. That is how detailed uh, we can be with these. Now, quickly, uh, how this works is a complex system that involves a lot of people, like you can see here. There are people who we call publishers. So that's what everyone is aware of. A publisher is any company that has a website on the internet that allows advertising on it. So it's Yahoo, Microsoft, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, those companies where you see ads. And then you have a lot of companies involved in between. They're collecting data. So if I wanted to place an ad on uh, MSN or New York Times, I would go through an ad, ad exchange. Nowadays, they're called the SSP. This is supply side platform. This is where the advertiser signs up and says, I want to be an advertiser. The DSP is the demand side platform. This is where the advertiser signs up and says, I want to advertise. And then we specify the profile of the person we're looking for. And the uh, real-time bidding system will take over and decide that my ad is the best ad that matches this person right here this second. Based on the content this person is reading and all the other things they've done on the internet prior to coming to this website. In between, there are third party platforms. These people do one single thing. They collect data about everything and everyone. So when I'm running an ad, I'm able to go on and say, I'm looking for these kinds of people in this specific geographic location with this specific type of behavior. And these third party platforms will tell me we got 10 million of these people and I can decide to advertise to those people. So the sources of the information that we get can be explicit. It means the consumer goes somewhere and signs up and presents their information. They say, okay, I'm fine. You can advertise to me. You can market to me. Uh, in some cases, they didn't sign up, but they clicked okay. You know those privacy notices? They say, okay, go ahead. Most people don't read it, uh, any of it. So... Uh, they said, okay, so they kind of gave permission. Those people will come back and sue you. You got to remember that if you're a marketer, they may come back after they say they gave permission. Uh, the covert strategy is the complicated one. It's where you're browsing around, you're walking around, you're driving, you have your phone, it's collecting data nonstop, or maybe you have wearable technology like a watch or anything else that's connected to the internet. Data is always streaming from these. This is the most dangerous one that raises privacy concerns. The fact that we're using so much data, the fact that we're using such a complex system to collect the data, and the consumer is not very knowledgeable about these systems, raises privacy concern. Now, generally, we say privacy is the right for a consumer to be left alone. Uh, on the internet, it's more like the right for the consumer to have control over who gets to use their personal information. And privacy concern is different from privacy. It's the extent to which consumers worry that there will be potential invasion and misuse of their personal information. Meanwhile, they do not have the facility to prevent this abuse of their information. So that's where marketers are having challenges. It's where the privacy concern uh, comes into play. So the sources of the privacy concern is the way we collect the information, overt or covert collection strategies. Uh, the way we store it, where is it? Who has control over it? Can I just tell you to stop? Can I tell you to delete it? If you're you know, using my information, sharing it, and then how we use it. 
So the big places that people think are problematic are cookie. So I think everyone hopefully knows what a cookie is. Uh, the food one that's loaded with salt, sugar, and fat. It's the one on the internet. It's, it's shocking that we name this thing the same as the food people uh, who are struggling with a very similar uh, problem. So first party cookie is the, it's a small code that is placed on the person's website or on their application that you're using. So I'm the owner, I have a website, you go to my website, I'm the one collecting this information, I'm using first party cookie. Why is that important? Because if it's first party cookie, there's no third party involved. Later you will see why um, the first user of the data, the collector of the data, is at a lower le level of risk than a third party user. Third party is where I'm using information from that big list of people I showed you, the systems. If I'm getting data someone else collected and I'm using that to market to a consumer, the consumer is thinking, where did this come from? Like, I didn't tell you anything. How did you know this? Are you listening to me? They're spying on me, right? So to some degree, consumers say that the use of third-party cookie is creepy and it freaks them out. Literally, that's what they've said in, in a lot of uh, studies. So the level of personalization is another important issue. So levels of personalization vary in terms of like, you know, salt, sugar, and fat. You could say um, it's 2% fat, right? Or it's low fat or it's less sugar. Well, that's what this is. Same thing. We're saying you can barely personalize an ad just because the person maybe did a search for information. Or I could go extreme. I could say maybe they searched. I don't want to advertise to the person who only searched. I want to advertise to the person who actually clicked. What about they added it to the cart? Oh, they went to the store. <laughs> then they were discussing it with their friends on social media. You see the difference here? If I heighten the level of personalization, the consumer will start just thinking we're, we're being stalked. Is literally what some consumers say, that the companies are stalking us and how are they doing this? And a synced advertising is another very extreme version. It's where you see the same ad on your phone, on your tablet, on your TV, and on any device that you're using almost anywhere you go. This is probably the most extreme version of an ad that's also personalized and targeting people using the same device. So uh, because of all these issues, consumers have responded with lawsuits. Uh, most famous one is the Facebook lawsuit, but all over Europe, there are tons of lawsuits. If you ever research lawsuits, privacy, related lawsuits related to Facebook, Google, Amazon in Europe, it's loaded because uh, the laws are different. They're real laws actually that say marketers can't do certain things. Uh, there are advocacy groups uh, calling for more regulation, especially, especially in the US uh, because we technically have no laws except the one in uh, California. And then the rest of it, consumers avoid the ad, they reject the ad, they block the ad. Some people pay money not to see an ad and they still see the ad because these things actually don't work. And from a marketing standpoint, I have to tell you that's genius. It's the same as the salt, food, sugar, and fat issue. We have a lot of uh, argument, a lot of discussion going on about why they're bad for you, about how you can avoid them. But every time we change the name of something uh, or some ingredients and we say, we communicate some messages that reduces the tension and the consumer just continues uh, to go on their merry way. Obviously there are some positives, they click on the ad and they buy. So it's not all bad and most of the time it's good. But when it's bad, it's really bad. That's the problem because it hits the news, right? And it's poor publicity or negative publicity for the marketer. So some theories that I will quickly just uh, give an overview of. A is a privacy calculus uh, theory, which says basically that the consumer is rational and they're thinking, okay, if I give up my privacy and I get some uh, relevant information and I get more rele relevant information than the privacy I give up, everything is great, right? Risk and reward. I will talk about why that is just 
not what really I think is going on. Social contract theory is another one that they say, well, if I share my information with you, whether overtly or covertly, you take it. I think that you and I have a contract. You shouldn't share it unless I give you explicit permission to share it. And you also shouldn't use it outside of what I expect you to use it for. In other words, I expect you to be responsible with my personal information. Uh, the psychological reactance theory really addresses the degree to which people react when they feel like a boundary that, they've be, that they have set has been passed. And so they will do the avoidance, the reactance, they will sue and take aggressive action. The information boundary is similar, except that this explains where the boundary is. So if you think about it this way, if your mother is like my mother was, uh, we had a big family, so eight of us, and she would say something like, hey, Leon, I'm going to tell you something, okay? But do not tell anyone. And you go around, and then all of a sudden, three other family members are like, hey, my mom told me this, did she tell you? And then she finds out and she goes nuts and she says, I didn't tell you to tell anyone. What's the going on is she's saying, look, it's my information. Although I told you and I told them, I don't want you to tell them. If I wanted to share this information, I would share it myself. This is partially what's also happening online. Last one is the privacy paradox theory. And this is basically we're confused. It's a paradox. Consumers love personalized information, but then they're complaining that, well, I didn't tell you to use it to personalize the ad that I actually love. And then they react and they sue and they take all types of action. So the privacy paradox is what marketers generally are trying to solve here. To what extent can we help the consumer to resolve the tension that's going on between they won't do anything to protect their privacy. They will use the information they receive from us after we use their privacy, but then they're going to sue us after all of this is done. So this is the real issue for marketers uh, to resolve. So marketers have um, responded by displaying a lot of ads. So that website you went to, you see that, did you guys see the pop-up? Did anyone click anything about it? Like. Uh, Configure the pop-up. I agree. I Did you just all accept all of it? I agree with everything. <laughs> you never personalized it. You never said that uh, I want to select some preferences. What does it mean if you say, no, I don't want you to collect any information? Most consumers don't know what it means. But that's one of the things that marketers have done. So we've displayed icons, you know, that blue arrow you see on an ad, or sometimes it just says an ad. If you ever click it, it actually provides some information about what's going on. We have privacy policies and we have pop-ups. And the big one here is uh, first party to zero party data. Remember first party data, data that we collect on our own website. Zero party, I collect zero. Again, this is like salt, sugar, and fat, okay? The marketers in the digital environment are basically using the same playbook as the food marketers. So if I say zero party data, no cookies, also cookie-less tracking, Google is introducing that this year. What does that mean? A consumer does this. Okay, right, no more cookies, yeah? But what does it mean? What it means is we're not doing cookies. We're doing device tracking. That's worse than cookies. And that's what's coming. And consumers breathe a sigh of relief when they hear that. I would say it's genius marketing. And I don't want anyone telling me it's deceptive, OK? <laughs> because um, it is marketing. There are more uh, effective ways, however, to do marketing. Like I said, uh, here are some of the things you would have seen. So this one says, accept all the cookies. This one says, manage my setting. This one blocks out the entire screen here. And you can set your cookies or you can accept all of them. And here, this is ad choice. This is one of those tags I was telling you about, okay? So if you click this, it will take you to a place that tells you why you're seeing this ad. Not really telling you that. It's kind of giving you like, hey, maybe you're seeing this ad for these reasons. Almost done. And uh, some of the results we get is dismal. 
80% of consumers are still concerned about their privacy after all the marketers have done. And this is uh, what Google said at their last privacy seminar in, in May, when they were rolling out a lot of AI to collect more data. And uh, you have this big Facebook settlement, 725 million in uh, December last year. And then you have more regulation coming and consumers use ad blocking that has cost the industry over $11 billion in 2021. So uh, we're still showing ad. And I suppose it's like the pharmaceutical industry. We produce some drugs, they have some side effects, we get sued and we pay, and that's a part of the business. Digital marketing, marketing ex is expected to grow and become the largest part. Of, it will represent over 70% of marketing by 2026. So if we're not slowing down here. We're picking up speed in spite of all the privacy concerns. And still people are installing ad blockers and consumers are believing that we should leave them alone at the same time. Some solutions that I think uh, may work, consumer education, that's a big one. Uh, how do we provide the consumer education? It, it's a challenge because you could see that website you went to uh, it blocks everything out. It literally forces you to do something. Why? They know most people are not going to read anything on that pop-up. They know most people are not going to make any settings to the changes. That's just a legal protection in Europe. They're saying, look, if you see all of this and you close it, and then you go and I collect your information, you cannot sue me. Second, we see more self-regulation from the industry. Why? Because the real solution to this is building trust, transparency with the consumer. What we mean is the consumer must say, okay, this is Microsoft. They're not going to abuse my information. It's okay for them to use it. Or get the consumer to opt in. Opt in used to relate to things like email marketing. You guys remember those days? They say no more spamming. Spam cam, uh, can spam, right? The can spam act. What happened to that? If you abuse people's privacy and you send them unsolicited email, the company is supposed to be sued. You're supposed to opt in. Now we're saying you should opt in to online behavioral advertising. Uh, some other more shifty changes, just noticeable minor changes made by marketers like changing names, saying we're changing the methods we're using and so on. Shifting the focus and the perception uh, of the issue from things like cookie to with something we don't uh, we haven't named yet. And obviously there is the government regulation. That's the last thing we want as a market, the government to take over. Uh, finally, I will say um, in the last meeting with Facebook, um, CEO Mark Zuckerberg and Congress, Congress did not understand anything about privacy that Mark Zuckerberg was talking about. And because of that, they are unable to enact laws that will protect the consumer because majority is not just like regular consumers, majority of people are unaware of the complex mechanism. On the other hand, there's no way for marketers to effectively personalize advertising to people without data. So if we say you cannot collect data, like in Europe, it's costing a lot of money a lot of companies are unable to carry out effective personalization because a lot of consumers have opted out of their data being used. So as a result, we say we have a second segment coming where we'll explicate more about some solutions and about some newer types of uh, technologies that are coming out and newer research that will help us. Uh, and I will share at that time my personal solution, which I'm working on as well. So. Uh, if you posted questions, I think uh, we could take them now. And if you have more, you can continue posting. Uh, thanks again for uh, UBIS uh, for hosting uh, this event. As you can see, it's something I'm very passionate about, and I really intend to generate some solution for this issue. Great. Thank you, Leon. Uh, wonderful presentation. We do have two questions that have been put in the, um, the chat. The first one says, is dealing with sync, when you were on that slide, um, how is it that that this can happen? 
Uh, and then the follow-up question with embedded question in that is what is the magic technology here that allows them to sync? Um, I guess when you were saying sync, it was across um, um, devices. Devices, yeah. Great. So those two great questions, right? How is it happening is the thing that triggers privacy concerns, literally. Because the consumer says, what is this? How is this? Are they listening to me? So the consumer is making up what's happening. But how does this happen? You have a phone. You go out. We drive somewhere every day. If you ever use map like me, you don't have to tell it where you're going. It knows where you're going. So your device ID is the magic. But you don't only have a device ID. You also have an IP address. So at home, most devices now don't use the coaxial cable for TV, right? For TV programming, all of it is being streamed over the internet. So your device in your home has an IP address that's located where? in your physical address. And where did we find that phone ID that you used to go to wherever you went to? In that same location. Who is in that house with this ID? You. So as a result of that, you also have other devices that you then take home, you know, like your laptop, and you connect it to the same internet. So it merges all of this data and then serves the ad to the consumer based on that data. Now, the listening which I brought up, every company has denied that they're listening, but you, well, that they're saving your conversation. But Amazon just got sued two months, three, three months ago because a parent discovered that their kid was ordering things using the Alexa they had in the home. And that's how all the stuff was coming to the house and then she found out that all of this conversation with Alexa and the kid was actually stored in the Alexa account so I mean I don't know if you needed proof that people are that the companies are listening because you could talk to your device you could say okay Google I hope this one doesn't come on and it will start responding the only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't respond if you don't um, give the, the code word which is Google uh, for it to come on but it is listening. The question is, what are they doing with this data? So it's not because it's listening is what I'm trying to say. It's because it's triangulating all of your activities based on your location, based on what you're watching. You know, the shows you watch on Netflix and Amazon Prime on uh, any other TV programming that's streaming over the internet. And then it is using this data to serve you the synced advertising. Great. I think all our students understand triangulation from the statistical perspective. Of oh, yes. <laughs> a second question. Um, what's the role of the advertising association in this industry? Uh, with a comment, the publisher might have unfair competitive advantage. And then about ethics of the content Ooh, uh, on advertising. That's, that, that's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ethics. But the role of the advertising industry is uh, in 2010, uh, they created the Digital Advertising Alliance. So when you see those ads, you know, like the one I showed you, uh, let's see if I could get back to that here. If you click on this ad here, this little button here that says ad choices, that is from the Digital Advertising Alliance. And they come up with a set of rules that say, this is how you should tell people what's going on and that you're collecting their information and how you're collecting it and how they, you are using it. So uh, the, the alliance is really the framework that governs the self-regulation online. The problem is all of these things are way behind, okay? So for example, on social media, Mark Zuckerberg basically, he has freedom to do whatever he does because it's just him technically with Facebook with a volume of data that they have about people. So they haven't put anything in place and neither has the government. So we're all just making this up as we are going. Uh, regarding ethics, 
The problem is that consumers are saying, I didn't tell you to share my information. I expect you to be responsible with my information. I think you collected it unethically. How did you even get it? Is what they're saying. And maybe you're saying, well, what should marketer do? I always go back to the food industry. Why? Cigarettes, they have a label on there that says this thing will kill you. And people still purchase it. The food, everyone knows that too much salt, sugar, and fat is bad for you, but the people are still buying it and we're still complaining. So the marketer, if you think of what the marketer believes on those two issues, they believe in one single thing. Where is the consumer's responsibility? They're saying the consumer is responsible for clicking this tab here. That's what they're saying. Is that a solution? Yeah, you could say, uh, as a marketer, I'm ethical, but the consumer is going to sue, and we're going to get bad publicity. Mark Zuckerberg settled the case. He could win that case. He could win the lawsuit with Cambridge Analytica, where they used the data in the election. But he settled. But his argument is, you know, every single thing that we did in this campaign is outlined in our privacy statement everything but he still had to settle because where he, he there's no winning so there's a difference here between the ethics and the legal issue and it's a challenging one like i said because consumers find the practice to be beneficial significantly marketers find it even more beneficial because they make a lot of money but then the consumer complains regarding the publisher there's more than publishers involved here. So there is a issue when it comes to uh, who is involved in this issue. Most people think it's three, right? The publisher, the advertiser, and the consumer. The problem is I just gave you a list here. And the publisher just has a website. And they signed up with an SSP, a supply-side platform like Google or Amazon, and they say, I have space, you could put ads on it. The real-time bidding technology is what decides what ad goes where. So it's the publisher on their website are the ones that should have the disclaimers. Remember the ad choices, right? So when you see an ad, not every ad has it. There are many ads that if you click them, it first doesn't have ad choices. And when, where you click when it says add beside it, it actually doesn't take you to a page that says, this is what we're doing. Those are the unethical things that we see and that we say are malpractices in the industry. Okay, we have time for one more. The next question, the last one, sort of delves into your second presentation, but let's take a stab at it anyway. Um, the question is about your views on PIPL, which stands for Personal Information Protection Law in China, uh, where internet privacy concerns are more significant and regulators claim they're superior uh, to the regulations of the GDR, GDPR. So if you want to take a stab at that, and then we'll uh, have a, I'll have a closing comment. So I'll honestly tell you, I've read one study on that, which is where uh, uh, I believe it's, well, one researcher compared the laws in, in, in the Netherlands with the laws in China. Uh, it's a different country. So as you know, the government involvement is different. And I would also put the US in there too, right? So you got Europe, you got China, and you have the US. In California, we have a law. In the rest of the country, we have no laws regarding basically what happens with a person's data in the US. And in Europe, we have the, G, the, the law. And in China, the government does not have to go through the steps to say uh, what should happen. So we, uh, the study that I did look at did uh, concur with what uh, the person is asking, that the laws are stiffer. But again, it's not a full-fledged democracy, right? Where people get to decide. This is our problem. Uh, we can't just make laws like that. 
There are people pushing back, right? Who is pushing back? All the powerful advertising agencies are pushing back against the government. But our government honestly just, you know, is lacking in terms of what really is going on. But this industry is very valuable. It's very significant. It's huge. If we can collect the data, what will happen? You have to remember in China, there's a version of TikTok for the kids. And in America, there's a different version. In America, it's freedom, right? You just go online and spend the whole day. And we serve ads the whole day. Every time a person is unable to serve an ad, it means someone is not making money. And this is a capitalist system where it's, we, we're focused on making money. And the consumer is responsible for protecting themselves. Great. Uh, well, that wraps it up, everyone. I want to thank our speaker, Leon Roberts. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you. And I'm really looking forward, and let me speak her, I think, the group to your second presentation. Um, and I just, before we close, I want to remind everyone, we do have another presentation scheduled on August 30th. You'll get a, a separate email on that. Um, and that topic is dealing with academic entrepreneurship, how faculty, research faculty have designed and developed products and how they've become business people. Uh, and it's going to be a fascinating presentation also. Again, I want to thank Leon and I want to thank everyone that came to uh, uh, this event today. And um, that will be it. If you have any further questions about any of this colloquia, please send me an email and I'll, I'll get right back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Great. you. Thank Leon. you. <laughs> Welcome. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night. Is, uh, how are you? <laughs> Hi, thank you. I'm at a conference in Pakistan on oh. food security. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to take us off now. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh,